Move on, and um, this morning Brian Mullins will be laid to rest. Uh, I'm delighted to say we have with us in studio Brendan Egan, who of course played football for Sligo, is also a professor of sport and exercise physiology at TCU, but more important in this context is a member of St Vincent's now. Uh, when did you transfer to Vincent's? Uh, that was in 2013. Right. So I had actually known Brian professionally because I had been lecturing at UCD from 2011. Right. So our paths actually crossed more, crossed more on a professional basis prior to, I think he became our senior football manager in 2017. Okay, so right. Did mine. he have any influence in uh, which club you joined when you moved to Dublin? No, funny enough, he didn't, actually. I had very little interaction with him in those first couple of years. The reason I joined St Vincent's was I had been a student in DCU for a long time, had uh, trained uh, under Mickey Whelan quite a bit, had spent the odd summer when I wasn't with Sligo, then trained with St Vincent's, so it was the logical step, yeah. It's funny how the, the link with Mickey Whelan and the link with Kevin Heffernan mm. and Brian Mullins, it's all part of the same, like in America we call it a coaching tree, yeah, but yeah. it's like um, their imprint on Irish sport is so deep mm. and particularly at an academic level and I think that it's interesting that um, you, you were at UCD because I think like everybody's been talking about his influence on the football field mm. and like clearly that dublin Kerry rivalry is something that catapults Gaelic football mm. out of the casual out of the interest of, exclusively of, of Gaelic football fans mm. and into the mainstream it mm. becomes this absolutely massive cultural yeah. event and I, you know, I think loads of people better qualified than me have talked about that but I'd, I'd love to get your t- your take on how influential his role in UCD has been because mm. what they did by really investing heavily and talking about the scholarship system it kind of kick started that whole mm. thing but then apart from that they also took sports seriously as an academic thing yeah. and that's very important yeah look I mean the, it, there's a huge amount of tributes are flowing in on the on the football side but obviously there's many facets to Brian's life and one of them was around that that whole area of director of sport in UCD and uh, the influence that he had over there and the again the positive impacts that he had on so many people you know are unbelievable over there as well and yeah at that time and it was true of many universities there was sport wasn't taken so seriously you know people people who were competing took it seriously but universities probably weren't funding it to any great extent but then putting in place positions of of that like a director of sport having someone like Brian who you know his his ability to pull people together and get everyone ro- going in the same direction I mean his leadership from that point of view like that really did catapult UCD along in that way and I think you've probably heard the stories of his instrumental role in bringing Leinster onto campus and everything that flowed from that so well Leinster yeah. said that he was he was um you know the most welcoming of the people there I didn't realize that he'd kind of had been helpful in engineering to get them there because they're a real anchor tenant it's like Huge, yeah. you know high-end uh, world-class performance mm. team is situated in UCD on a day-in, day-out basis. I, I don't know if everybody fully appreciates that, like, the training ground is literally on the UCD yeah, campus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, and like you say, he was part of that, and uh, generally that's one element of the campus over there, but there's a huge amount then just on the general sports side of things that he was involved in, in terms of the expansion of their facilities, and he was, had a very uh, prominent role as well in their healthy campus initiatives as well, so touching every aspect of you know the quality of life over there on the campus. I think one of the other things is most people who um, would have seen or been aware of him as a, a a public persona, you know, it's the gruff footballer. It's, he's <laughs> hard as nails, but actually, when you meet him, he's, yeah. he's a lovely man. I know, unbelievably rewarding uh, smile and uh, character. Yeah, when you get to know him, and uh, you know, it's funny. Over the last few days, a lot of what people have said, you know, people sometimes distance themselves when they're talking about someone who's passed away. They say, you know that person will be missed or something. But uh, people I speak to, they're all saying, I will miss him, you know. And that's the way it's, people sort of felt about him, was that they got, when they got to know him and they knew his personality and how rewarding it was to be in his company, you know, that, that's what people are going to miss. It's funny as well, like uh, some of the stories, uh, Brendan, as well, that, that seem to, I know it's a cliche to say that, that you only really find out about a person properly when, when mm. they die, but some of the stories that have come out about him, you know, I didn't realise that he was such a talented, multi-talented sports person <laughs> yeah. in terms of rugby and cricket as well. Yeah. Uh, and even the recovery from his car accident years mm. ago to, to kind of recuperate. But it's one of those things that there's so many stories that have come out about Brian in the last mm. couple of days. It's quite quite incredible and, and a testament to him as well. Oh, yeah. And, like, uh, he had that joy for life. The, the first interaction I had with him in, in the context of St. Vincent's and him as their manager was uh, we had we had just lost the All-Ireland semi-final to Slock Neal and our, our management team at that time had moved on. And it was a difficult team to take over because we'd had so much success over the previous three to four years there's a lot of us who were fairly well on, big personalities, and uh, you know I'd say no one in the club wanted it, but Brian was probably the only person that could take it on, given his his status and his you know his ability, as I said, to bring people together. But the it was you know sometime in in March, weather was really bad, we couldn't go out on the pitch. So his first session, he calls, he brings us all into the hall in St Vincent's, which is a small hall, you know, typical of a, of, a, of a club, and we thought, oh, this is just going to be a chat. He decides we're going to have a training session. 
and so he's got the balls there and it was the, the way the hall had been set up there was like there was chairs along the side it hadn't been tied for playing football or any sport at all and he decides we're still going to have a session so we're standing you know 10-15 yards away from there they're just kicking the ball back and forth hand passing back and forth he gets bored of that and he decides right we're going to have a game and it's some kind of a hybrid game of netball and GAA and of course, as I said, we were all a bit cynical at this stage, and I was looking around going, This is ridiculous, it's unsafe. Like, there's probably puddles of water, you know, it was raining heavily or whatever. And the next thing I look around, and there he was in the middle of it all. It's a big smile on his face, arms out looking for the ball, hitting off other fellas, elbowing them out of the way. And I mean, you just had to laugh at the uh, at how much he was, how, how much enthusiasm he had for it, and how up for it he was. And yeah, that was something that he took on then for the few years that he was with us. Uh, go on. You wouldn't want to batter into him either, I'd say. No, I mean, that's what's unbelievably big. Like, so I don't know, you've probably heard people talk about the size of his hands, but like, I mean, <laughs> there was no getting past him if that hand was laid on you, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, that uh, that team you, you talk about it full of characters so there's uh, yourself Jared Brennan Mossy uh, Connolly I can't mm. imagine it was an easy dressing room to walk into who, who had been beaten in an All-Ireland semi-final mm. obviously felt like there was more there for them yeah and and like we had at that time we were probably pushing it, you know the standards uh, higher than most had been you know at club level in terms of the approach um, the way we use video analysis the work we put in on the opposition that kind of thing and um, we obviously wanted that to continue and in fairness Brian was he was a more old school he probably didn't realise getting into it that that's the level that things had gone to uh, at that point but again testament to him like he adapted very quickly realised that you know with just the right uh, sort of tools and cokes and whatever he could get us all moving in the same direction and we won the championship that year actually as it happened lost to Rathnew then in the, in the Leinster championship but uh, yeah continued on the success in that first year anyway it's so Nathan was on that team and he did a lovely tribute on social media as well calling his dad his, his superhero um, and uh, you know that was, that was a good team you guys had yeah um, that at that time I suppose it was uh, we were getting on in age um, and over the n- next couple of years after that um, through immigration retirement injuries well, we totaled it up at one point from like 2017 to 2019 we'd lost something like 16, 18 players you know right. 6 or 7 of them were starters so uh, that was really nothing to do with Brian it was just uh, the timing of it and uh, he held it all together well and uh, obviously then he was in charge during the COVID interrupted years as well and that was a challenge in its own right but like I said earlier leadership was one of his strengths and he kept, he kept everyone moving in the same direction I was talking to somebody in the club the other night and he was saying that loads of people you know, you listen to intercounty footballers and they're always talking about, oh, the club, the club, the club, the club. Mm. But actually, for Brian Mullins, it was literally the the, oh, yeah. the bit, the be-all and end-all. And you'd often see him on the bike around, going down to meet somebody and, um, like, taking that role on when nobody else would take yeah. it would be kind of emblematic or, or stereotypical of, of the commitment that he had. Yeah, for sure. And he, he had served in numerous roles in the club. And I mean, that, that is another huge loss that's going to, you know, be here. But he'd been adult games director as well. And the men moved on, obviously, into football. But when he was the senior team, when he was our manager, I mean, he was still the guy who was down there before everyone else. And the last to leave, he was putting up the nets. He was taking it, you know, I mean, he was filling the water. He was doing everything that there was. And in a lot of cases now, you know, people have multiple different backroom team members and they do all that but he just loved being there and uh, getting involved and like I said always uh, rewarding with a big smile and very enthusiastic there was no negativity with him at all That strikes me as a man with, with no ego whatsoever like you know for someone who has the All-Irelands in the back pocket and yeah. the reputation that he has to, to then go on later in your in your adult life to, to, to do those menial tasks where yeah. you're filling the water bottles and, and fixing the nets and turning off the lights and that sort of thing that probably is it says a lot about him. Yeah, humility is a huge thing and uh, in sport, you know, we build up a lot of players and even from a young age you come across some players who have no humility whatsoever and here you have Brian who, you know, by all accounts is always in, named as one of the best and, you know, best ever in his position and, you know, he never showed any sign that that was on his mind or that he need, needed to be treated differently and, you know, that whole thing about the car crash, I'm, I'm not a great historian now of GAA but I'd been told that car crash story in the recovery several times and the first time I met him though, I, again, on, this was actually on the football field, it was like a I don't know, was it married versus single or some one of those games over Vincent's? But there he was, togged out, ready to play. He must have been, yeah, in his early 60s at that point. But he didn't, you know, one of these knee bandages on that do nothing for anyone. <laughs> but uh, he was wearing one anyway. And uh, yeah, still in keen to be involved. And, uh, you know, I was just trying to make chat with him at that stage. And I said something about, how's your knee? And, you know, without assuming that I knew his big story, he starts telling me, well, I was actually involved in a crash a few years ago. And, you know, I recovered. And it still gives me a bit of trouble. But I, that's why I cycle so much. It keeps it going. Just again, uh, just didn't, uh, didn't have any airs and graces about what I should know about him or not. So yeah, just playing it all down. Yeah, and like it's 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 one of those things as well. Sometimes a player that's been 
so heavily involved in the seventies or eighties. By the time they get into their sixties, they're mm. they're they're not recognisable from the player that they yeah, were yeah. physically. But Brian still had that that physical presence, and, oh, yeah. and I know there was probably a lot of uh, maybe not students getting scholarships, but but parents of students getting scholarships who maybe got a buzz off <laughs> seeing Brian and maybe getting excited that oh it's Brian Mullins that yeah, they're getting the scholarship yeah. off essentially. You probably yeah. saw the same in your club Pe people who didn't realise it was Brian and then they got chatting to him and. Yeah, got a buzz yeah. out of it. Yeah, no, he was. Uh, yeah, that. I mean, his reputation went to heaven. But like I said, he didn't. Uh, he didn't uh, take advantage of that in any way. You know, he was always still very humble and just uh, got on with the chat with whoever came to speak to him. Yeah. From that academic perspective, it's it's really interesting because obviously he's a great GA man. Mickey Whelan's a great GA man. But the fact that they had this kind of broader sporting hinterland, I think, is really important. Mm. Mickey, in, in his book, if if anybody hasn't read it, you should get your hands on it. Um, talks about the other sports that he played, and I know he coached um, the Irish University soccer team. Team, um, at World Games and, and really benefited from that broader experience and it feels like um, Brian Mullins um, benefited from that broader experience as a young player playing cricket in Clontarf and then rugby for Leinster underage before he becomes a, a Dublin superstar. At, at, when he gets to UCD he's not biased in favour of the, the um, GA element of it at all like, and I think that's probably why that whole thing worked. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there, going back to just as at a young age, there is that whole idea that we shouldn't, you know, force kids into specialisation at a young age and playing multiple sports again that have different features of them tends to be beneficial in, in the long run. So that's on on the physical side, but as you say, on the on the overall cultural side to be exposed to different sports because many sports have very different cultures, you know, and and practices and so on. And yeah, you don't want to end up being someone who favours one over the other. And as you say, in terms of the the UCD scenario, when you've got I actually don't know how many sports clubs they have there, but you have to cater for all of them, and they all are well represented in the different uh, committees, and you know, uh, he used to play with that, yeah. As somebody involved in, in third level uh, in a sports department, I don't know, mm. is the department officially called sports? Um, health and Human Performance. Health and yeah. Human Performance, okay, <laughs> great. Well, like, is it fair to say that himself and Mickey Whelan, their fingerprints are certainly on the, the genesis of that as a field of study that's taken seriously by the academic institutions, that it helps to have somebody who's been involved at that level. Yeah, I think I think so. I think so. Sports science was coming as a discipline anyway in, in the seventies and eighties, and the likes of Mickey and and Brian, who were proponents of the scientific approach, you know that. Sort they of both had it. to go away to study it. Isn't yeah, that well, right? they, yeah, they both both spent time abroad, and Mickey in particular had done. I think it was his masters in physical education, or uh, he'd also done a PhD then when he came back to DCU. So you know, lifelong learning, as as you know. Um, but yeah, that uh, that uh, ability for yeah prominent people to give sports science in particular credibility that that does matter um the programs themselves are obviously very popular then with students you know because they're into sport and they think yeah you know rightly or wrongly that elite sport is where they want to work but i mean the whole idea of sports science is that there's that exercise component as well and that's got all the obvious knock on benefits for health and everything well that's the bit that has yeah. exploded in the last yeah. decade or so yeah. that has turned um, small companies into unicorns and, yeah. Yeah. and you know everybody's wearing their wearables <laughs> and, and uh, uh, i like the way you laugh there <laughs> i don't wear one <laughs> what does that tell you <laughs> <laughs> um, one last question for you. We saw doing the rounds at the weekend a goal from Mossy Quinn, who's what, 50 now at this stage, uh, still scoring? Mm -hmm. 41, I think, is, is the right <laughs> age, yeah. He, would, he wouldn't like you to put him too many extra years on him, but... Uh, You're keeping yeah. the land together, at least. Yeah, well, I mean, the... Um, the uh, you just, know, just to point out, you did say that they were ageing in 2017. Yeah, I know, I know, and I know. Here we are in 2022, so, and you're all still playing. Some, yeah, of, yeah. some of us hung in there, but uh, no, I mean, on a serious note, uh, Brian obviously was manager when, when we were relegated senior two last year, and, uh, you know, there was this kind of hope. I often hear that... Yes, um, uh, hearing is the last sense that you lose, you know, and we were all kind of hoping could he hang in there until we actually got the semi-final, got promoted. And, I mean, he was uh, he was really taken aback by by that relegation. That really hurt him uh, on a personal level, and he was really keen to, to get us back there. And, again, the new management came in, and Brian was, you know, as I was speaking to Nathan, his son, you know, Brian was interested in at every game he co possibly could be. So to finally, you know, pull it through and get back to, to senior one around the same time that he passed, you know, there was a... Something poetic in that, but it was it was great, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. totally. And so, are you all going to come back for one more year, just because you well, can't got, leave it? It's a long, it's a long winter these days, you know. It's a split season. <laughs> yeah, we've we've a long time to think about it. So a long time to get fit, <laughs> <laughs> or get unfit, yeah. depending on how you go. Brendan, good stuff. Thanks, a million. Thanks. That was lovely. Brendan Egan there, former Sligo footballer and uh, St Vincent's footballer as it stands now, and of course, professor of sport and exercise physiology at DCU. We're going to take.